Good morning. The dictionary defines guarantee as an undertaking to answer for another's failure to pay a debt or perform a duty. In that sense, Jesus guaranteed our salvation. The definition of warranty is a statement that some situation is as it appears to be. That is, there is integrity in what is being promised. In that sense, Jesus' appearance to his disciples in today's gospel was his warranty that he would make good on his guarantee of salvation. Today we celebrate this act of God's mercy. The atmosphere for the disciples in today's gospel was tense. The disciples were collaborators with the rebel Jesus, and Jesus was executed. There was every expectation that they would be next. And to put this in context, they did not know that Jesus was God. After all, only Peter was given the insight that Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus only told the woman at the well that he was the Messiah. The disciples thought Jesus was dead and gone forever. They were frightened. In the midst of our individual suffering, or the suffering of a loved one, whether physical, mental, or spiritual, haven't we had that same feeling arise? Then all of a sudden, and totally unexpectedly, Jesus is there before them. To alleviate all doubt, he shows his own suffering is in his hands and side. Yet incredibly, he says, Peace be with you. This simple yet profound statement is repeated three times in today's gospel. We recall his statement at the Last Supper before he died, when he promised that he would give them peace, which no one could take away from them, whatever trials they might endure. His disciples were mainly Jews, and in Jesus' time there was a debate between the Pharisees who believed in an afterlife, and the Sadducees, who did not. That's why they were sad, you see. That's all I remember. So the disciples' fear was not just that they could be killed, but also, what if the Sadducees were right? But by Jesus' very appearance, he conquered death itself, and showed that there was life after death. This is why the greeting, peace be with you, was so powerful. This was the confirmation that he was truly God. It is why we celebrate Easter as a more important feast than Christmas. Sometimes in our secular world, we only hear news as if we will live forever. A newscaster recently said, in effect, get a grip, we are all going to die. Wow. Intellectually, listeners knew this, but psychologically, this was true news to many listeners. A relative of mine by marriage was an atheist, and his intellectual arguments were vehement. Then on his deathbed, he went through utter psychological and spiritual torment. It was no longer just theory. He was at the doorstep of his absolute end. He did not experience peace. The disciples were overcome with joy. The unbelievable had happened. Jesus was still with them. Jesus had promised this at the Last Supper, when he said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. Their joy and peace would last forever. At Easter Vigil last weekend, converts were fully initiated into the Catholic Church through baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. One once told me that she felt for the first time a true sense of peace because she now belonged to a community that understood her and had mutual beliefs. This was not some sort of intellectual 
theological peace, but a palpable, visceral peace. And that is the kind of peace Jesus was talking about. We are both body and soul, and both are intertwined in this dance of peace. It is indeed real. But how did Jesus warrant this guarantee of joy? By breathing on them and saying, receive the Holy Spirit. It is reminiscent of God breathing life into the mud of the earth and forming the first human being. Here there is a new creation. That is why Paul calls a Christian a new person, a new creation. The word spirit means breath. But as we all know, as much as we need to breathe the air, it does us no good to hold it in. We must exhale. It is of value only when we exhale and give it to others. This is the strange anomaly of the Holy Spirit that we cannot possess the Holy Spirit, but only experience the Holy Spirit by sharing. It was not enough for disciples to live a peaceful life just for their own future with God. That is why the communal life is so important, as described in the first reading, that every day more people joined in church. They were sharing in the Holy Spirit, and they too felt that peace Jesus had promised. That is why the converts in our own church describe their experience as peaceful. This is reinforced by Jesus' dealings with Thomas, doubting Thomas. Jesus knew that all later followers, us included, would not have physical access to Jesus in the locked room with the apostles. So when Jesus invites Thomas to touch his wounds, he is inviting us to do the same through faith, not touch. We experience his presence in that room by receiving the Eucharist today. Then we, like Thomas, will fall to our knees in worship and say, My Lord and my God. That is why the first line in today's first reading from Acts says, that the essence of our lives together in Christ and his peace is summed up in four inseparable elements. That we must remain faithful to the teaching of the apostles, communal life, breaking of bread, and prayer. But in our everyday life, how do we recognize Jesus without being doubting like Thomas? The mystics tell us that if we think we know Jesus, then we certainly don't. It's not only that we can't know, but we can only know Jesus by unknowing that we can experience him in real depth. In other words, only when we don't impose our image on him, but allow her to impart her image on us. Science tells us that 95% of our brain is dedicated to the unconscious, which can learn even though we are not fully aware. Isn't that consistent with our understanding of the roots of our faith? Science also tells us that the universe is non-local, since certain events that change on one side of the universe will simultaneously change on the other side. Not because they communicate faster than the speed of light, but because the phenomenon is a fundamental property of creation itself. Isn't that consistent with our belief that God exists everywhere simultaneously? So there are multiple answers to the question, where is Jesus? Each is deeply personal and can lead to a peace if we have faith and allow them to permeate us with the presence of God. They may include a morning dove, a red sunset, a snow-capped mountain, pain and suffering, the souls of others, a gentle breeze, the Eucharist, 
art and music. Please close your eyes now and imagine looking up at Michelangelo's incredible paintings in the Sistine Chapel, seeing God's finger touching Adam's finger, and hearing an angelic choir praising God in song. Feel his peace flood down upon you. <laughs> 